the way ahead. Organization for Action will now, and in the decade ahead, center upon America's white middle class. That's where the power is. When more than three-fourths of our people, from both the point of view of economics and of their self-identification, are middle class, it's obvious that their action or inaction will determine the direction of change. Large parts of the middle class, the silent majority, must be activated. Action and articulation are one, as are silence and surrender. We are belatedly beginning to understand this, to know that even if all the low-income parts of our population are, were organized, all the blacks, Mexican-Americans, Puerto Ricans, Appalachians, poor whites, if, if through some genius of organization they were all united into a coalition, it would not be powerful enough to get significant basic needs changed. It would have to do what all minority organizations, small nations, labor unions, political parties, or anything small must do. Seek out allies. The pragmatics of power will not allow any alternative. The only potential allies for America's poor would be in various organized sectors of the middle class. We have seen Cesar Chavez's migrant farm workers turn to the middle class with their great boycott. In the fight against Eastman Kodak, the blacks of Rochester, New York, turned to the middle class and their proxies. Activists and radicals on and off our college campuses, people who are committed to change, must make a complete turnabout. With rare exceptions, our activists and radicals are products of and re rebels against our middle class society. All rebels must attack the power states in their society. Our rebels have contemptuously rejected the values and way of life of the middle class. They have, st uh, they have stigmatized it as materialistic, decadent, bourgeois, degenerate, imperialistic, warmongering, brutalized, and corrupt. They are right. But we must begin from where we are if we are to build power for change. And the power and the people are in the big middle class majority. Therefore, it is useless self-indulgence for an activist to put their past behind them. Instead, they should realize the priceless value of their middle-class experience. Their middle-class identity, their familiarity with the values and problems are invaluable for organization of their own people. They have the background to go back examine and try to understand the middle class way now they have a compelling reason to know for they must know if they are to organize they, they must know so they can be effective in communication tactics creating issues and organization they will look very differently upon their parents their friends and their way of life instead of the infantile dramatics of rejection they will now begin to dissect and examine that way of life as they never have before they will know that a square is no longer to be dismissed as such. Instead, their own approach must be square enough to get the action started. Turning back to the middle class as an organizer, they will find that everything now has different meaning and purpose. They learn, um, they learn to view actions outside of the experience of people as serving only to confuse and antagonize them. They begin to understand the differences in value definition of the older generation regarding, quote, the privilege of college experience and their current reaction to the tactics a sizable major, uh, minority of students uses in campus rebellions. They discover what their definition of the police is and their language. They discard the rhetoric that always says pig. Instead of hostile rejection, they're seeking bridges of communication and unity over the gaps, generation, value of others. They will view with strategic sensitivity the nature of middle class behavior with its hangups over rudeness or aggressiveness, insulting profane actions. All this and more must be grasped and used to radicalize parts of the middle class. The rough category middle class can be broken down into three groups. Lower middle class, middle middle class, and upper middle class. There are marked cultural differences between the lower middle class and the rest of the middle class. In the lower middle class, we encounter people who have struggled all their lives for what relatively little they have. With a few exceptions, such as teachers, they have never gone beyond high school. They have been committed to the values of success, getting ahead, security, having their own 
own home, auto, color TV, friends. Their lives have been 90% unfulfilled dreams. To escape their frustration, they grasp at the last hope that their children will get that education and realize their unfulfilled dreams. They are a fearful people who, who feel threatened from all sides. The nightmare of pending retirement in old age with social security decimated by inflation. The shadow of unemployment from a slumping economy. With the black community already fierce, uh, fearsome because the cultural conflict, threatening job competition, the high cost of long-term illness, and finally with mortgages outstanding, they dread the possibility of pop property devaluation from non-whites moving into their neighborhood. They're beset by taxes on incomes, food, real estate, and automobiles at all levels, city, state, and national. Seduced by their values into installment buying, they find themselves barely able to meet long-term payments, let alone the current cost of living. Victimized by TV commercials with their fraudulent claims for food and medical products, they watch the news between the commercial with Senate committee hearings showing that their purchase of these products is largely a waste of their hard-earned money. Repeated financial crises result from accidents that they thought they were insured against only to experience the fine print evasions of one of our most shocking confidence rackets of today, the insurance racket. Their pleasures are simple. Gardening a tiny backyard behind a small house, bungalow or tiki-taki, in a monotonous subdivision on the fringe of suburbs, Going on a Sunday drive out to the country, having a once a week dinner out at some place like a Howard Johnson's. Many of the so called hard hats, police, fire, sanitation workers, school teachers, and much of civil service, mechanics, electricians, janitors, and semi skilled workers find themselves in this class. They look at the unemployed poor as parasitical dependents, recipients of a vast variety of massive public programs, all paid for th by them, the public. They see the poor going to college with the waiving of admission requirements and given spe special financial aid. In many cases, the lower middle class were denied the opportunity of college by those very circumstances. Their bitterness is compounded by their also paying taxes for these colleges for increased public services, fire, police, public health, and welfare. They hear the poor demanding welfare as rights. To them, this is an insult on top of injury. Seeking some meaning in life, they turn to an extreme chauvinism and become defenders of the American faith. Now, they even develop rationalizations for a life of futility and frustration. It's the red menace. Now, they're not only the most uh, vociferous in their espousal of law and order, but ripe victims for such a demagogic George Wallace, the John Birch Society, the Red Menace Perennials. Insecure in this fast-changing world, they cling to illusory fixed points, which are very, very real to them. Even conversation is charted towards fixing your position in the world. I don't want to argue with you. Just tell me what our flag means to you. Or, what do you think of those college punks who never worked a day in their lives? They use revealing adjectives such as outside agitators or troublemakers. And other, when did you last beat your wife? Questions. On the other side, they see the middle middle class and the upper middle class assuming a liberal, democratic, holier-than-thou position and attacking the bigotry of the employed poor. They see, through that, uh, see that through all kinds of tax evasion devices, the middle, middle, and upper middle can elude their share of the tax burdens so that most of it comes back, as they see it, upon themselves. The lower middle class. They see a United States Senate in which approximately one-third are millionaires, and it's more now, and the rest, with rare exception, very wealthy. The bill requiring full public disclosure of senators' financial interests and prophetically titled Senate Bill 1993, which is probably the year it will be finally be passed, is in committee, they see. And then they say to themselves, government represents the upper class. 
not us. Many of the lower middle class are members of labor unions, churches, bowling clubs, fraternals, service, and nationality organizations. They are organizations and people that must be worked with as one would work with any part, other part of our population with respect, understanding, and sympathy. To reject them is to lose by default. They will not shrivel. They will not disappear. You can't switch channels and get rid of them. This is what you have been doing in your radicalized dream world, but they are here and will be. If we don't win them, Wallace or Spiro T. Nixon will. Never doubt uh, that the voice may be Agnew's, but the words, the vindictive smearing is Nixon's. There never was a vice president who didn't either faithfully serve as his superior's faithful sounding board or else be silent. Remember that even if you cannot win over the lower middle class, at least parts of them must be persuaded to where there is at least communication. Then to a series of partial agreements and a willingness to abstain from hard opposition as changes take place. They have their role to play in the essential prelude of reformation, in their acceptance that the ways of the past with its promises for the future no longer work. And we must move ahead. Where we move to may not be definite or certain, but move we must. People must be reformed so that they can be, de uh, so, that, oh, Jesus. so that they cannot be deformed into dependency and driven through desperation to dictatorship and the death of freedom. The silent majority now are hurt, bitter, suspicious, feeling rejected, and at bay. This sick condition, in many ways, is as explosive as the current race crisis. Their fears and frustrations at their helplessness are mounting to a point of political paranoia which can demonize people to turn to the law of survival in the narrowest sense. These emotions can go either to the far right of totalitarianism or forward to Act II of the American Revolution. The issues of 1972 would be those of, of 1776. No taxation without representation. To have real representation would involve public funds being available for campaign costs so that members of the lower middle class can campaign for political office. This can be an issue for mobilization among the lower middle class and substantial sectors of the middle middle class. The rest of the middle class, with few exceptions, reside in suburbia, living in illusions of partial escape, being more literate. They are even more lost. Nothing seems to make sense. They thought that a split-level house in the suburbs, two cars, two TVs, country club membership, a bank account, children in good prep schools, and then in college, and they, they had it made. They got it, only to discover they didn't have it. Many have lost their children. They dropped out of sight into something called the generation gap. They have seen values they held sacred, sneered at, and found themselves ridiculed as squares or relics of a dead world. The frenetic scene around them is so bewildering as to induce them to either drop out into a private world, the non-existent past, sick with its own form of social schizophrenia, or to face it and to move into action. If one wants to act, the dilemma is how and where. There is no when, with time running out. Time is obviously now. There are enormous basic changes ahead. We cannot continue or last in the nihilistic absurdities of our time, where nothing we do makes sense. The scene around us compels us to look away quickly if we are to cling to any sanity. We are the age of pollution, progressively burying ourselves in our own waste. We announce that our water is contaminated by our own excrement, insecticides, and detergents, and then do nothing. Even a half-witted people, if sane, would long since have developed the simple and obvious— Ban the detergents, develop non-polluting insecticides, and immediately build waste disposal units. Apparently, we would rather be corpses in clean shirts. We prefer a strangling ring of dirty air to a ring around the collar. Until the last, we'll be buried in bright white shirts. Our persistent use of our pres uh, present insecticides may well ensure that the insects shall inherit the world. Of all the pollution around us, none compares to the political pollution of the Pentagon. 
from a Vietnam War simultaneously suicidal and murderous to a policy of getting out by getting in deeper and wider to the Pentagon reports that strained even a moron's intelligence that within the next six months the war would be won to destroying more bridges in North Vietnam than there are in the world to counting and reporting the enemy dead from his helicopters, quote, okay, Joe, we've been here for 15 minutes. Let's go back and call it 150 dead to brutalizing our younger generation with my lay, uh, with my lies, but ignoring our own principles of the Nuremberg trials to putting our soldiers in conditions so conducive to drugs that we stand forth as freedom's liberating force of pot. This Pentagon, whose economic waste and corruption is bankrupting our nation morally as well as economically, allows Lockheed Aircraft to put one-fourth of its production in the small Georgia country town of the late Senator Russell, a powerful man in the military appropriations decisions, and then transmits its appeal for federal millions to save it from financial fiascos. Far worse is the situation in the late Representative Mendel Rivers Congressional District, he of the House Military Affairs Committee, where the phenomenal payoffs of every kind of installation from corporations vying for Pent Pentagon gold. Even our solid state mental vice president described it in a way he thought was amusing but is tragic beyond belief to any freedom-loving American. Quote, Vice President Agnew praised Mr. Rivers for his willingness to go to bat for the so-called and often discredited military-industrial complex as 1,150 generals, congressmen, and defense contractors applauded in a ballroom in the Washington Hilton Hotel. Mr. Agnew said he wanted to lay down the re uh, to rest the ugly, vicious, dastardly rumor that Mr. Rivers, whose Charleston, Charleston, South Carolina district is chock full of military installations, is trying to move the Pentagon piecemeal to South Carolina. Even when it appeared Charleston might stink into the sea from the burden, said the uh, vice president, Mr. Rivers' response was, I regret that I have but one congressional district to my country, uh, to my country to, I mean, give to my country. New York Times, August 13th, 1970. This is the Pentagon that has manufactured nearly 16,000 tons of nerve gas. Why and what for being unclear to, except to overkill the overkill. No one has raised the question. Who got the contracts? What did it cost? Where, where were the payoffs? Where did they go? Now the big question is how to dispose of it as it deteriorates and threatens to get loose amongst us. The Pentagon announces that the sinking of the nerve gas is safe, but from now on they will find a safe way. The obvious American way of assuming personal responsibility for one's action is utterly ignored. Otherwise, since the Pentagon made it, it should keep it and have all of it stored in the basements of the Pentagon. Or since the president as commander in chief of our armed forces believed that the sinking in the ocean of the 67 tons of nerve gas was so safe. Why didn't he attest to his belief by having it dumped into the waters off San Clemente, California? Either action would at least have given some hope for the nation's future. The record goes on without any deviations towards sanity. The Army chose the final days of hearings of the President's Commission investigating the National Guard killings at Kent State to announce that M-16 rifles would now be issued to the National Guard. The President's Commission report is doomed not to be read until after the bowl games on New Year's Day by a president who watches football on TV the afternoon of the biggest march in history on Washington, Moratorium Day. There are our generals and... Their scientific gremlins who, after assurance of no reactive, uh, re radioactive menace from the atomic tests in Nevada, now, more than a dozen years later, have sealed off 250 square miles as contaminated with poisonous and radioactive plutonium-239. This from the explosions in 1958. Will the safe disposition in 1970 of the nerve gas still be as safe a dozen or less years from now? One can only wonder how they'll seal off some 250 miles of the Atlantic Ocean. We can assume that the same scientific gremlins will uh, be assigned to the disposition of the thousands of tons of additional stockpiled nerve gas, out of which approximately 15,000 tons are on Okinawa to be moved to some other island. 
Compound this with a daily record of now we are in Cambodia. Now we are out. Now we're not in. It's just over it with our bombers. Now we won't get involved as we are in Vietnam, but we can't get out of Vietnam without safeguarding Cambodia. We're doing this, but really the other with no clue to all this madness except the half helpful comment from the White House. Don't listen to what we say. Just watch what we do. Half helpful only because either statements or actions are sufficient to make us freeze into bewilderment and stunned disbelief. It's in such times that we are haunted by the old maxim, those whom the gods would destroy, they first make ludicrous. The middle class are numb, bewildered, scared into silence. They don't know what, if anything, they can do. This is the job for today's radical to fan the embers of hopelessness into a flame to fight, to say, you cannot cop out as many, uh, as many of my generation. You cannot turn away. Look at it. Let us change it together. Look at us. We are your children. Let us not abandon each other, for then we are all lost. Together we can change it for what we want. Let's start here and there. Let's go. It is a f- job first of bringing hope and doing what every organizer must do with all people, all classes, all places, and all times. Communicate the means or tactics whereby the people can feel that they have the power to do this and that and so on. To a great extent, the middle class of today feels more defeated and lost than do our poor. So you return to the suburban scene of your middle class with its variety of organizations, from PTAs to League of Women Voters, consumer groups, churches and clubs. The job is to search out the leaders in these various activities, identify their major activities, find areas of common agreement, and excite their imagination with tactics that can introduce drama and adventure into the tedium of middle life, a uh, middle class life. Tactics must begin with the experiences of the middle class, accepting their aversion to rudeness, vulgarity, and conflict. Start them easy. Don't scare them off. The opposition's reactions will provide the education or the radicalization of the middle class. It does it every time. Tactics here, are already, as already described, will develop in the flow of the action and reaction. The chance for organization for action on pollution, inflation, war, violence, race, taxes, and other issues is all about us. Tactics such as stock proxies and others are waiting to be hurled into the attack, if you so choose. The revolution must manifest itself in the corporate sector by the corporation's realistic appraisal of conditions in the nation. The corporations must forget their nonsense about private sectors. It's not just the government contracts and subsidies that have long since blurred the line between public and private sectors, but that every American individual or corporation is public as well as private. Public in that we are Americans and concerned about our national welfare. We have a double commitment and corporations had better recognize this for the sake of their own survival. Poverty, discrimination, disease, crime. Everything is as much a concern for the corporations as it is profits. The days when corporate public relations work to keep the corporation out of controversy, days of playing it safe, of not offending Democratic or Republican customers, advertisers, or associates. Those days are done. If the same predatory drives for profit can be partially transmuted for progress, then we'll have opened up a whole new ballgame. I suggest here that this new policy will give its executives a reason for what they are doing, a chance for a meaningful life. A major battle will be pitched on quality and prices of consumer goods, targeting particularly on the massive misleading advertising campaigns, the cost of which are passed on to the consumer. It will be the people against Madison Avenue or the Battle of Buncombe Hill. Any timetable would be speculation, but the writing of middle-class organizations had better be on the wall by 1972. The human cry of the Second Revolution is one for a meaning, a purpose for life, a cause to live for, and if need be, die for. Thomas Paine's words... These are the times that try men's souls are more relevant to part two of the American Revolution than the beginning. This is literally the revolution of the soul. The great American dream that reached out to the stars has been lost to the stripes. We have forgotten where we came from. We don't know where we are and we fear where we may be going. 
afraid, we turn from the glorious adventure of the pursuit of happiness to a pursuit of an illusionary security in an ordered, stratified, striped society. Our way of life is symbolized to the world by stripes of military force. At home, we have made a mockery of being our brother's keeper by being his jail keeper. When Americans can no longer see the stars, the times are tragic. We must believe that it is the darkness before the dawn of a beautiful new world. We'll see it. <laughs> we'll see it when we believe it.